postcards. Uh, sometimes you're going to be seeing the backside. Uh, be, a lot of the things that I'll be talking about are actually in various rooms throughout the museum here too. You'll also notice that you don't speak a lot about the park. Bar Harbor was very well known in a famous resort long before Akita National Park came along. Of course, it was Lafayette National Park in 1919. So before that, people were just coming here because of Bar Harbor, <coughs> and we had our own iconic things that uh, people came to see. So without further ado, I'll start. And uh, the postcards were available before 1898, but you can see an act of Congress back that year made them official and they were regulated. And the good thing that that did was before then a postcard to send it out was the same price as a letter. And after that date, uh, you could do postcards for one cent. So um, that worked well. And the other thing too, is this is way before telephones. And it wasn't unusual for someone just to send a postcard to a neighbor eight or five miles down the street would have been quicker than them trying to get there. So if they were having an event or something, they might have sent a postcard. And it's always fun, too, to read what's written on some of these things. I mean, this one here, uh, Miss Nellie Smith, and that went to Pride's Crossing, Massachusetts. And that's upside down, but we can tell that date was 1904. And postcards were a huge business. Millions were sent out every year. Now, uh, until 1907, the message was on the picture side. That means the other side was strictly for the address. And this one is looking from shore. And we're looking out at Bar Island. And these are mostly friendship sloops. Uh, you might not be aware of it, but back then, uh, most of the lobster fishermen were fishing off friendship sloops. This is before they had their uh, motors. I can't imagine how difficult it would be to get into a trap and let your sail walk and stay there long enough to pull that trap in, but that's how they did it. And again, you can see the date on there, July 16, 1905. And again, messages were on the address side after 1907, so all the writing was on the back side, which gave more room for the photograph on the front side. And what I really uh, found mystifying or interesting about this one was the address this was going to. 307 Ammunition Train, Camp Jordan, somewhere in Georgia. So you have to assume that this guy was in the military and uh, he was getting a postcard from somebody back home. So again, uh, I always enjoy reading the postcard. Now a lot uh, these postcards, I had a collection of about 300, and my dad had about 300, so I combined them. So these are a combination of both of our collections that we'll see tonight. Now this is uh, something that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I think most of you might recognize this, though. This was the Erie, and this was Rockefeller's estate in Seal Harbor. Now this particular it's just black and white. What happened with these is they were sent overseas and they were what they did, they called colorized. Now these would go to Asia or India and people would just get this postcard, they'd get no notes with it, and their job was to just color it. And they could do any colors they want, they were supposed to make it look better. And here's what would happen when they did that. So you can tell it's the same place, but the colors are definitely a little different than what's on the building. And now I'll show you a real color photograph done in the fall. So see, those are the real colors of it, and they do blend in nicely with the uh, mountains in the background. So it's, it's, it's amazing, though, how different the black and white the color is to real color. And here's the same thing I'm doing at this time with Skylands, and this would have been Edsel Ford's estate. Of course, this is where Martha Stewart lives now during the summer. And again, black and white, very bland, but we do the colorization. And you can tell it's the exact same postcard. But again, a lot of different color in there. And then you go with the real color, and that's what you end up with.
Now, a lot of uh, local businesses had their own lines of postcards. F. E. Sherman, W. H. Sherman, uh, Jordan Pond House, Bees. It wasn't just a candy store back then. They sold all kinds of stuff. So uh, that's kind of neat too. I've got to tell you a little joke looking at this one. Uh, it's my the tour guide in me. This is a joke I used to tell on the tour. And uh, the tourist asked the guide, me, uh, where did all these rocks come from? <laughs> and being a man of few words, I just said, glacier. And he was a little annoyed. He said, well, where did the glacier go? And I said, back to get more rocks. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. <laughs> well, the other thing I wanted to mention to you before I start talking about this particular photograph was um, Maine was the nearest port to Germany, and most of the postcards were sent to Germany to be finished. In Germany, they had actually invented lithography, and that would have been back, believe it or not, in 1796. Uh, that process just means that you're taking a smooth surface, whether it be a rock or metal, and then you could put your ink on it and you kind of stamped out your cards. So that's how you could do the repetitive cards. So through Germany, them doing the lithography, and then the photographs that they reproduced were sent back to Maine, and two men in Portland uh, did distributed most of these cards around the country. One's name was Chisholm, and the other was Hugh Layton. Hugh Layton ended up becoming the uh, mayor of Portland, so they both did very well with them. Now, another man from Portland was Bill Ballard. Uh, he ended up moving to Southwest Harbor in 1934. Uh, his favorite uh, palette would be to do everything in black and white. He did a lot of postcards, but he was even better known for his black and white photographs. And very seldom did he have people in his photographs, mostly nature photos, sailboats, uh, stills, and stuff like that, but he just didn't have a lot of people in them. So this is what you'd call a lobster shack. Uh, and we have one of those here in our garage now. But you've got every piece you can imagine in there from your clam hog, your clam hole, uh, oars, boats, bait bags, uh, more bait traps, lobster traps, rope, a little bit of everything. So that's what uh, a lobster shack would have looked like. And again, you still see a lot of uh, Bill Ballard's work around town. He was very well known, and again, uh, he lived in Southwest Harbor. Now, there are several ways to tell how old postcards are. Very seldom did you have the copyright on the postcard itself, but in this one, you actually did. And this was made in 1901. And uh, we're looking uh, pretty much from the Newport House, which would have been on Agamont Hill. And you're looking at the Eastern Steamship Wharf on the left, and uh, the uh, Eastern Yacht Club on the right, of course, which is the Bar Harbor Club. And uh, you're looking out at the Porcupines, and there's a couple of steamboats there too. Do you think that one was colored? Th th that was hand colored. Yeah. Yes. So that was the other process. You could hand color the postcards too, as opposed to sending them overseas where they were colorized. Uh, so some of them were pretty neat and very time consuming for them to make. Uh, fashion was another way to date them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the Bar Harbor Club. And for those of you that have lived in Bar Harbor a long time, you may know that it was Mrs. Owen's house on the Bridge Street, right down here. And I just met the new owners of that. I think his name is Richard Ross. And uh, they just bought that house from the Harbors. But I used to be Mrs. Owen's paper boy. <laughs> and she had a, a lot of trouble getting people that would continually deliver her paper, especially in the winter. <laughs> because the wind comes out of the northwest and the drifts down there were awful. <laughs> but, but she was a good tipper. So <laughs> continued to deliver her paper for her. She's a very nice lady. But anyway, uh, so we're, you're looking at the grandstands. The original Bar Harbor Club was called the Swim Club. 
that was built in 1903. And the same architects, Andrews, Jacques, and Rantoul, who were designing La Rochelle in 1903, also designed the original club at the Bar Harbor Club. And I wouldn't dare to tell you uh, what they clothes those people are wearing, but I do know that on the postcard on the other side, it's postmarked in 1900, oh, next page. Yeah, the uh, 1907. So that's what people were wearing back in that day. Now the next postcard is kind of neat. You're going to get a view from behind the grandstands. So now you're looking at the bar island, and look at all the homes on the island. Of course, we know they could only get back and forth at low tide uh, unless they had a boat. And again, notice how dressed everybody is to the hilt. And there are parasols, uh, people playing tennis there. Now, the, uh, the club was torn down and rebuilt during the Depression and reopened in 1930. And uh, my grandfather, Von Koff, actually was the tennis pro there. He taught tennis lessons at the Bar Harbor Club. Now, I, I know another story that my mom told me. She was born in 1925. And so this had been about 1938, I'm guessing, or 1940, maybe. She and a friend, um, John Elstar, uh, her first name is Connie. Armstrong, right. Well, she and my mom snuck in one night to swim in the pool, and uh, they found out about it, and they drained the pool the next day. <laughs> so, you know, there were prejudices at all levels of society, and sometimes things like that happen between uh, the wealthy summer people and the local people, <laughs> too. But, but again, so this was actually a saltwater pool, and they had big stones that they lined it with and the tide would come in and rush over the rocks, rocks and fill it up and then the sun would warm it up. So. Now another name, a, reason, a way you can tell the date on a postcard or when it was approximately made was by name changes. We know that uh, Acadia was Lafayette until 20, uh, 1929. So this card had to be made before then. Now they call it the mountain road, but that's really the road that goes to Jordan Pond. That is not on the mountain. And the other way would be transportation. Mm -hmm. Now no cars were allowed in Bar Harbor until 1913. So we know this looking west on Cottage Street, and this looking toward Bar Island, these are both before 1913. Yeah. And this, when I was growing up, this is one of the Acadia shops now. Uh, that was Paquette's shoe store. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that wrong, there's no R in that word, okay? <laughs> P-A-Q-U-E-T. Sturdy brown shoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And again, you could tell by the location of a building. This doesn't look anything like the YWCA today. This is the old YWCA, and that was on Cottage Street. Now we know that the new YWCA is on Mount Desert Street, and that was built in 1913, and most of the money to build that was donated by Mrs. John S. Kennedy. Now, about 10 years before that was built, this is Morris Jessup donating the money to build the library. Between 1903 and 1913, a lot of uh, the major anchors in Bar Harbor were built, including the town office. That would have been 1908, and that was the high school. As a matter of fact, Fred Savage designed that building, as he did a lot of shingle-style buildings around town, and he actually lived on uh, Atlantic Avenue. And uh, the post office was also built for them. So there was a lot of big building going on in Bar Harbor back then. And all the way down in the back, of course, that's the Abbey now. And that was the YMCA. And uh, that was there while I was growing up. And they're getting ready to celebrate their 125th anniversary. And also, 
if something was torn down. This is Chapel Hall. This would have been Joseph Blitz's estate. And uh, this was off Sealy Road. And so you know that pretty well, Barbara. And that was torn down in 1944. And uh, he actually had a tower built on his house. It was called the Tower of Silence. His hearing was very sensitive. And so he had this soundproof room built so he could go in it and not listen to the, the bell or the foghorn, which seemed to ring constantly <laughs> offshore. So we actually have two chairs in the reception room uh, that came out of Mr. Plitz's house. And that's the other thing, in all these rooms are pieces that did come out of the various estates. Uh, the candelabras behind you all on each side of the door uh, came out of the McCormick estate. Uh, that's where the Bayview Hotel is now. Um, but uh, the Cyrus McCormick actually invented the Reaper, uh, an international harvester is the McCormick family's company now. And this, again, uh, one of our major disasters was certainly the fire of 47. This is where all of the fire departments made their stand, very close to here. Uh, it's right here. This is the corner of West and Eden Street. This is the guzzle here where the water runs down on the other side of the property. And so that's the last piece that burned coming into Bar Harbor. So that's why that park was named the Great Bar Park, or excuse me, Green. And uh, extraordinary events certainly tell you what they proposed for us were too. Uh, this happened in 1938. My mom would have been 13. This was in July. And this passenger cruise ship ran aground on uh, what we call breakwater or bald porcupine. You can imagine living on the shore path, waking up on a Sunday morning, <laughs> looking out your window, and seeing that ship out there. Uh, and you, you can tell how massive it is, looking at the people down here in the two boats. Uh, they were very fortunate that they only hit the beach and not a ledge, so they were able to refloat it again in high tide. And again, another event. Uh, this was when I was 13 years old. This would have been 1963. And uh, we had a whole eclipse of the sun that came right through Bar Harbor. So that was kind of neat. Any of us of uh, our age period that lived here will certainly remember that. And our parents telling you, don't look at the sun, don't look at the sun. <laughs> oh, yeah, now we get into the funny ones. <laughs> um, this would be a generic postcard. They loved these, the manufacturers, because they'd sell them anywhere. They didn't need to be specific or have a name on it. I'm sure they sold more of these in Georgia than they did Maine. <laughs> uh, but the fact is, uh, that postcard made it up here to Bar Harbor somehow. Mm. And, and again, this is not Sand Beach, it's not the Town Beach, it's not Seal Harbor Beach, where you would see islands out there, and rocks, even old soaker at Sand Beach. But that would be something, all they needed to do was change the name. They could sell it in any coastal community anywhere around the United States. And uh, also, through nostalgia, or things that don't exist anymore, uh, this is Robin Hood Park, also known as Morrell Park. This would have been out where the Jackson Lab is. And again, this is strictly for the summer people. They had their horse shows and events out there, and uh, it was one of many big things in our pastimes and playroom. Uh, we list the, the reading room, the swim club, uh, the horse shows, uh, the pot and kettle club. There were numerous things that they had for activities. Of course, they could have come to a place like La Rochelle for dinner, and uh, uh, any of these dinners would have been industrialists, educationalists, scientists, who either had places in town or they might have been visiting here. We've had, over, we've had six presidents visit Bar Harbor. The most recent would have been Obama. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, you're looking at the building of the arts in the background, and uh, that burned in the fire, but it, it had already gone through its life, changed over several times, uh, was dilapidated and not in use anymore at that time. But we have a lot on 
the building of yachts in the living room here. So you want to come back and look at that. But what I want to tell you is this is the fourth hole of Kibo. Mm -hmm. Here's President Taft right here. Uh, this is earlier in the day. And I'll tell you why I say that, because later in the day, he got to what is now the 17th hole, and he took 27 strokes on that one hole. <laughs> there, there were only nine holes back then, so it was the eighth hole at that time. <laughs> By the time they got to the last hole, it was so dark that they had to put their headlights on so that they could see to make his shots to get to the green and finish his round. Now, this man over here on your far left is uh, Shirley Liskin. He was the pro at Kibo for probably 20 years. And uh, I think that his father, Andrew Liskin, was the head of the trail crew for the Village Improvement Association. They built all the trails before there was a national park. So that was his job. There were over 400 members in the BIA, both local and summer. But they had their own budget. They cleaned the streets. Uh, they planted flowers. Beatrix Farron, landscape designer. She was the chairman of the Aesthetics and Beautification Committee. So everybody was involved in that. But we have a hospital and a library, a YW, a YMCA, the Abbey Museum, a lot of amenities that uh, small towns with 3,000 people never had. I mean, growing up here, I thought it was normal. Every town had all that. But then as I traveled, I thought, wow, what was I lucky to live in a town to have the things that we did including the Jackson Lab, um, the uh, Acadia National Park, and more recently the College of the Atlantic. So again, we're very fortunate with the things we do have here. Now, we have a club that belonged to Shirley Liskin, and the only reason I know that was his name is engraved on the back of the club. I didn't even know it. Uh, but once the clubs were brought down here looking at the canvas bag, I saw his name engraved on the back. So you know, sometimes you don't even know what you have. Yeah, and uh, if any of you did grow up around here, I know Cindy will appreciate this, but uh, a favorite pastime was you drove around town. <laughs> and there was a loop you did. You went down around the pier. You went back up Main Street, you took a right down Cottage Street to the Exxon Station, you turned around the pole and went back down. Sometimes you go the other way down Main Street, but you always ended up on the pier. And uh, that's where all the activity was. But the other thing I wanted to point out with the color of these cars, this is one of those colorized photos. Most of the cars back in the 30s and 40s, we know they were all black. Mm -hmm. uh, the colors didn't come along until later, but it is neat to see that they thought to paint all these cars, these colors. They probably had no cars in India back in 1930. <laughs> so, but anyway, again, you're looking out at the Porcupine Islands, and that's the town of Peter. And the 4th of July was always a big deal in Bar Harbor. And Dr. Rells, Connie's dad, uh, who was a dentist, uh, had a big inn with the Navy, and always managed to get two or three sailing or ships, naval ships, in the harbor over the 4th of July. So that's why you see all the sailors marching. And they would put together a, or the town with a softball tournament, and the sailors would play in that. And the bars would just be hopping at night. <laughs> um, I remember my dad and my Uncle Jimmy, uh, Emily's grandfather, and uh, Bucka Smith, they all worked at the Green Door. That doesn't exist anymore, but it's where the sign is to the Bar Harbor Inn, going down Newport Drive. And the, the green door was in the basement. But my, my dad would come home those nights when the Navy sailors were in, totally exhausted, worn out, uh, tie off, just a, a mess. And his shirt rolled up and doing cups and dishes and cleaning up messes. But Fourth of July's were huge at Bar Harbor. And also notice the spectators. These are probably local people. They're all dressed up, suit coats, ties, and hats. So again, it was a big deal. And again, uh, there were iconic things, as I was saying, in Bar Harbor. And certainly Village Green was one of those. Uh, the hotel, the Rotic Hotel, was torn down. 
about 1900, the Village Green, the Village Improvement Association volunteered to take it over and lease it for one dollar a year. And they built this lovely park. And in 1920, uh, Beatrix Farron did some redesign and she put this diagonal path cutting all the way through the park and also moved the bandstand a little bit off to the right uh, to make it look more proportional. And again, people are very dressed up walking through here. I, I can't imagine if the photography must have just caught these people at the right time or uh, it was his wife and he made her dress up and be in the photo. <laughs> we'll never know, but the, uh, the Robertson bench is still there, we know that. And uh, all of the trees have turned over since then. Now another place that was very popular was the ovens. A lot of you might even have never heard of the ovens. They're not any place you can get them anymore here in Salisbury Cove. Um, down on, uh, just before Hadley Point. But you can go down to Sand Point Road to get there, or down through the George Bar Park, where Stephanie lives now. I'm sure you snuck down there a couple yeah. times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they have some very unusual caves and rock formations down there. And you can sail by and see that too. But that was one of the big deals and why they were postcards made of it uh, back in the day. And, and again, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this was in my dad's collection, I know, because that's his writing, and I would be scolding him for putting that on there. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that is the bluffs going out of our harbor. Um, we know it was very early. I'm not sure what kind of car that is, but uh, the year probably between 1905 and 1910, it might be a Knox. Uh, Knoxes were actually made in Springfield, Massachusetts. There are a lot of smaller car manufacturers back then, not like today where you just have the big three and other automakers that are huge. Now, uh, you'll also see people walking along the street there and others further up. And there was also a trail that went across the top of the blocks called uh, the Gurney Trail. And that's because Mrs. Gurney uh, spent the money to have that trail built by the BIA trail crew she also donated ball of rock to the Village Improvement Association, and we still own that today. Oh yeah, uh, and again, we have a lot of items about this. This is the Crown Princess Sesame. This was a German passenger ship. There were 1,200 people on board. This is 1914. They were in the middle of the Atlantic, very concerned about getting torpedoed. War just broke out in Europe, uh, not sure what to do, and they decided to seek safe haven, and they came into Bar Harbor. There were actually two summer people on that cruise, the lads, and he was a sailor, so he knew them, and was able to safely bring them in here. And that ship stayed here for a long time, so long that the crew and passengers were wine and dine, and I think at least one of the crew ended up marrying somebody local. Mm -hmm. The captain eventually ended up retiring in California, and uh, his granddaughter was here back around 1995 and donated several pieces to the museum mm -hmm. that are in our display case in there. Now, the United States government confiscated this ship. There was $10 million worth of gold bullion on her, mm -hmm. a million dollars worth of silk bullion, which they kept. And the ship was turned into a troop carrier to that grand troops over in Europe. So, very interesting story there. And again, we've got a, a nice piece of art and uh, several other pieces on display. And again, uh, human interest played a role in postcards that were made. Um, and the, this is, I'd say, a little bit of an embarrassment to uh, the people of Bar Harbor that we did what we did back then. Originally, uh, the Indians, they would come here during the summer and uh, not only get food, but they would run canoe trips and other things from the water. But they were eventually kicked off the waterfront because they wanted to clean that up. So they moved down to the ball field. And uh, they actually had these buildings down there. And uh, then they were removed from the ball field. As you can see on the bottom, it says now cleared and used as a park by the YMCA. But this was all land donated by John S. Kennedy. He lived across the street in what is now the Colcott's estate. 
So that would have been John S. Kennedy, who originally built there, and again, eventually building the dam to the town of Bar Harbor for their athletic field. I always, this reminds me of days gone by where you were safe. Um, not that many people traveled. Look at the two boys in their sailor uniforms there with their park ranger looking down at Eagle Lake. And, uh, you know, that just wouldn't happen today. Mm -hmm. but, but it's a very relaxing, pleasant scene to look at. And uh, this is a more modern one. This was probably done about 1980. And uh, I know this is hard to believe, but I'm actually in this postcard. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. I was down there every day, seven days a week. That was one of my stops on my sight team tour. And I know that's me because I've got my Northern Arizona t-shirt on <laughs> and my khaki pants, which I wore every day. And I had a spot when Thunder Hole was rough. I could go stand and it looked like I got soaked. But I got down behind the rock and it would drop on me. So I was quite surprised to find that postcard years ago. And I had it in my collection. I thought it would be fun to add. Oh, these next three are really something. Again, what people wrote on their cards is interesting. And, and you know, uh, even when they got phones, there were party lines. So a lot of people didn't want to get on there and spill their guts. <laughs> so they still sent postcards. But this particular one, I, I, again, in 1915, uh, she probably just sent them a lovely picture, put her name on so they knew who it was from. But a lot of people didn't write much on these cards, as you'll see. Having time to write. <laughs> ha. The boys are all right. Now, that was from Mrs. Annie uh, Grover in Tillman, Maine. That came from Bar Harbor, was sent to her. And this next one's my favorite. Hmm. No! <laughs> You know, and uh, that didn't go very far. That went from Ellsworth to Ellsworth Falls. <laughs> so, and again, that was 1909. Now, a lot of cards uh, were misprinted. Sometimes there are reasons for it, sometimes they weren't. Well, they called this St. Sylvia's. We all know that's the church, the Catholic Holy Redeemer Church. It's on the corner of Mount Desert and Ledgewalk. That is not St. Sylvia's. This is St. Sylvia's. That was a wooden church on Peebo Street. Now my great-great-grandmother, Mary Sullivan Lynch, went to St. Sylvia's. My great-grandmother, Gertrude Lynch Cott, went to the Holy Redeemer Church. This is a real classic. Now, okay, so this was taken, the photograph was taken, it was sent wherever they sent it to get it printed, and the people doing the printing called back and they said, what, what should we call this? And of course, the guy had a nice Maine accent. Well, that's the Shaw Path. Uh -huh. So what did they write in there? The Shaw Path, S-H-A-W. Does that say happy in Sylvia? It does. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? I'm going to wrap things up here at La Rochelle. This is actually across the street. Uh, when you leave, be sure to look at the caretaker's cottage. It's just down to the right across the street. It's probably three times as big as that now. But that is the original caretaker's cottage. This was a huge property. Not only did they have this side of the street, they had that whole side of the street. And it basically went through two cottage street. Uh, and notice the greenhouse and they had gardens and uh, probably stables on that side of the road. So uh, it was a huge property. Now my grandfather actually bought La Rochelle and the caretaker's cottage in 1940. And my dad and his three siblings were raised in the caretaker's cottage through 1947. And my grandfather sold this home to the Dorrances in 1944 
and they married into the Colgate family. So I'm sure my grandfather was thinking, uh, he didn't have this term back then, that he could flip the house and make some money. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is, these were all white elephants back in the 30s and 40s. Uh, you could buy these homes for fifteen to $20,000. They weren't insulated. Spent tons of money on them to heat them. Uh, even the people that were staying in them before them was rodents. They were only here for two months. So they, they didn't get used much. But anyway, so he bought it uh, and did sell it in 44 and again uh, sold the house across the street in 1947. And that's an interesting story too because they were looking at a house on Harbor Lane. Yeah, I have a lot of interesting stories. I'm not going to tell them. I have to. <laughs> so what happened was he had the key to the house on Harbor Lane. The fire comes through, burns down the house on Harbor Lane. So he buys the lot. The key is the only thing that survived. And then he sends his two boys and the girls out in his truck around to foundations of homes that burn to collect stones <laughs> to build the house. So that's why we call it the stone house on Harbor Lane. And they're all small stones so that they were able to handle them and move them and throw them in the truck. So I don't know if he got permission to do it or not. Probably not, knowing my grandfather. <laughs> then the last one is La Rochelle. Uh, in all its glory, with the tall chimneys, the awnings on the front, and note the uh, brick wall that used to go around. We noticed a couple of summers ago, we had a very dry summer. There was actually a deadline all the way along, around the property, so we knew exactly where that wall was. Now, when the Bowdens first uh, bought the estate, there was actually a home next door that belonged to the Shirley's. And uh, Mr. Shirley was from Kentucky. And uh, he, uh, um, Mr. Bowden, bought his home, or he bought the property. And Mr. Shirley took the home apart as a log cabin and put it back together in Kentucky. Here comes Emily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, what she'll do is just run it back to that last photograph. And uh, that does pretty much end the. I'm getting dizzy. Slow that thing down. But anyway, if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer them for you. And uh, if you want to come back another time, I'll bring another 40 coast postcards. <laughs> I promise I won't tell the same jokes. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for